What's going on everyone? Big Bob with Tales of a King. Today we're in North County, San Diego. We're going to be speaking with AJ, owner of Redbeard Original. You guys stay tuned. King Life. I feel like when someone asks me to do something for them, this is an opportunity for me to serve them in what I feel like has been given to me to do for them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like definitely. this is going, this is me being able to show you appreciation because you took your hard earned money. You could have spent it in any way you wanted, but you decided to do something a little bit extravagant and work with my family so that I could passionately provide you with a service. Right. Right. So then it's not about the money anymore. Now it's about me saying, I want to show you how much I am grateful to you so I'm gonna give you the work that I'm passionate about and it's not even a little bit I always try to exceed or go beyond expectations Tales of a King. Here we are, man, with AJ, owner of Red Beard Original. What's going on, AJ? What's up, brother? So a, a little, uh, we're gonna give you guys a little, a little background of how me and AJ uh, met. We actually met in 2014 mm -hmm. at Chicala Park at La Raza Run, drawn by uh, Vado Savica. And uh, uh, me and AJ, we just hit it off, man. We, I think we, we knew each other via Instagram. Mm -hmm. A little bit. And, uh, yeah, not too much. We just kind of, we're doing the like thing. And then we met in person, it was just like, Instant. Instant connection. And uh, here we are today. It was a bromance. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so man, yeah. tell me tell me a little bit about AJ, man. Now, tell the people. Tell the tell the people. Um I'm forty two. I am no longer single. I have four kids. And so I'm you're a ginger. Completely off the market. I am totally off the market. Okay. Like I have been bought and no give backs, no, no take give backs, backs, no returns. 30 day cycle is over, no receipts. 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what, what people don't know about me. I mean, pretty much an open book. Um, the four kids, I mean, they're the reason why I do this. Uh, they're a big reason why. My wife is, amazing woman and she's totally supportive you know I, I love her to death and actually if it wasn't for her trusting me in in at the time that we were doing something else we wouldn't even be doing this mm. uh, so and that's yeah. huge because I, I agree with that like you, you your spouse your wife has to trust 100% and believe in you and what you're doing. You know, I, I think it wasn't so much even believing in what I wanted to do, it was just that. She just believed in me. And I think even more so because she's uh, she's just a very strong woman of faith. I mean, she was also really believing, you know, in a higher power mm. making a call. Yeah. You know, and I think she recognized that at the time. I know she didn't necessarily like it was a hard step for her to go, okay, I'm gonna let him do this. It was really hard because I didn't necessarily do it in something in a way that was conventional or safe. Mm. You know, at the time um, when we first got started, I was basically like a, a handyman. And before that, um, I would do like murals and specialty textures and build like huge one-off pieces of furniture for, you know, the elite of America, business owners and stuff like that. And so we'd go to Rancho Santa Fe, La Jolla, and these people had unbelievable budgets to do really weird things. Like custom one-off wood, uh, woodworking? Yeah, man, like uh, some of the things I used to do was like these giant farmhouse tables. When farmhouse tables were really super popular back in the day, my spin on it though was doing something that had kind of like a post-modern twist to it, lots of metal and iron. And then I would get these giant slabs of wood that would be like cedar with live edge they'd be six inches thick wow. and they could be anywhere from like six feet to 15 feet long and they would be office tables or they'd go in somebody's house and I would charge good money for them so there was you know but I didn't do them a lot but I did them enough where people were asking for these okay. um, 
And then on top of that, I was also doing murals for kids' rooms and fun floors and Disney stuff. And if someone said, they, they would come to me and be like, I want in this corner of the room, I want like this cool tree, like a fake tree, like from Disneyland, but where my kids can go inside, climb up inside the tree into a spot with a light inside of it and they can hang out like a little bedroom and read their books and stuff. Mm, wow. And then I want a branch to come off this, the roof or the ceiling right. and I want there to be an actual swing inside the room. And I would do stuff like that. Wow. So you've always had like the artistic uh, ability and te technicality, I guess, right? That yeah, yeah, fun? yeah. The the love for the, the, the technical aspect of it. Yeah. You're not just a... a well, you you get in it. I get into it yeah. and I look at the details, you know. So for me, the I think the thing that gives me a leg up and sets me apart is my ability to visualize the end result, like what it's supposed to look like mm. when it's finished. Right. And then I can physically see that like on a movie screen in my mind. And then I can look at all the aspects of that and make changes right there on the spot Whoa. and then describe that to the client. And I think that's what gets them excited. So I can see all those things and then I can go backwards from there and say, okay, well, in order for a swing to hang from here, I need to build this structural thing. And from there, and like, and then I'll need these hooks with this chain and it needs to have this load bearing and the so I can reverse engineer it in my mind enough to the point of where I can describe it to somebody. And I thought about that. You show them, show them, give them the vision for the finished product and then break it down on how it's gonna. Wow. And I do that all in my head. So, and that's what I do with the leather work. That's what I do with all the custom seats is when someone says, well, I have this idea to do something and they're very, very basic and my mind already sees it. And so then I start describing to them what I'm already seeing visually mm -hmm. like, oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You're, you're ahead of them already. Oh yeah. Uh, but I get excited about this yeah. stuff, you know, like oh, yeah. the, what excites me is doing something that I have never seen before. Cause if someone says, well, I want something with guns hanging off the side and like, well, I've seen that. And that was like six years ago, mm. but I've never seen anything with bullets and knives and where the knives were an actual holster, not like physically stuck to the seat. Cause I right. think, you know, I, I've seen people since doing it. And actually the very first seat that I ever did that had that was this one up here, the El Pistolero seat. That's the first one that came out that had that look to it. And then since that one, it got, it went viral on multiple occasions yeah. through Pinterest, YouTube, uh, the Have you team. seen that on a lot of tattoos, tattoos? I drew the artwork. Well, I mean, have you seen that tattooed on people? I have not seen anybody tattoo I know that art. That. One of my best friends has it. You're kidding. I swear to you from that, from your seat. Shut up. You've yeah. got to send me that. I will. I'll, I'll text him that from. from Dude, I'll it's so, it's, that. it's so crazy uh, that I've had people who've contacted me through Facebook. Uh, and said, hey man, I, I saw that wall that you did. I hope I did your art justice. And they had like a tattoo on their hand. One yeah, guy put a man. tattoo on his neck and I'm like, my That's wife, honor, huh? it's a weird Dude. thing. You know, like, I'm like, man, you know, like the, the artwork has touched somebody to a degree that they want to make it permanent. Mm. Like to me, this is something that you could take off. You could take, you know, like, you know, you, it's not on you, but when right. you put it on you, you're making the artwork a part of the message of who you are. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to me, that's like a whole another level of appreciation. So yeah, man, I'd love to see that's that. That's awesome. How long, uh, how long have you been doing the, the is it leather works? What's, is there like a proper word or? or yeah, leather? I mean, leather, like leather craft, leather working. I mean, it's kind of all encompassing. That's like a really big umbrella okay. of a term. So. So there is no, technically there's no wrong if someone's. No, nah, I mean, if someone says, oh, that's really good tooling. That's mm -hmm. not, uh, you're not necessarily wrong. Okay. I mean, it's like very ambiguous. It's like a broad stroke of a term. But if you were just gonna say, oh man, the artwork you did, that's beautiful figure carving. Mm, then I know, okay, carving. you know a little bit more about leather because that's really what I do, it's yeah. figure carving. Figure carving. That's yeah. it right there, that's, that's the deal. Figure carving. Yeah, it's figure carving. So, um, but like in this, like when I'm doing just like seats like this, mm -hmm. this is really just more, in general, I would consider this more like the leather craft and so. And well, actually, what is this for actually? This is for a bobber seat. Um, the guy brought in and it, this is a redo. He had another guy do the seat, but it okay. didn't really work for him. Like it was it was nice when I saw it. I thought, I was, oh, that was a cool looking seat. 
um, but he's a smaller, skinnier guy. And this is from one of those like biker build off discovery channel oh, type okay. choppers. Yeah. If you can imagine what that looks like, it's got the just enormous tire that looks like it probably belongs on an off-road truck <laughs> <laughs> in the back. And, and it's got like the skinny raked out little tire right. in the front, you know, everything's chrome and very stretched out. Looks like it's a caricature of a real right. motorcycle. Right. Um, but it's a, uh, for what it is, it's a cool bike. Don't get me wrong. I like looking at it, but that's what I like doing. I don't know if I could ride it. But that being said, um, he brought it to me and he asked me if there's something I could do to fix it. And I said, I can't fix it. You know, like what I'll do is I'll redo it. Cause I'm not gonna touch somebody else's artwork. Like right. otherwise, if you want it to be done and still look the same, you should have that person do it. So when you say, when you say redo someone's artwork. I ripped it all apart did and that, then redid there it. No there was nothing it's left. It's fresh now. Okay. It's fresh, so yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't add to this or take from this if it, it wasn't it, yours right now okay, okay if someone brought me this right here and say hey i want you to do that i'd be like no you asked the guy that did that originally do it one i'm not taking food off someone else's table right and two it's not mine to do that too anyway I, so like i ripping it off you're good to go yeah i told him like if if that's what you want to do if you want to do a complete redo that's different. Okay. And he says, uh, so have you even reached out to the guy? He's like, yeah, I can't get a hold of him. I was like, you know, these are like the pre-qualifications. Cause again, like even still, I still think the original artist should have a chance to whack at it again, mm -hmm. unless there's been some reason why you need to cut all soul ties. You know what I mean? Right, like, right, right. so for me, this was like, as soon as he said, I want this to be a little bit thicker here and whatever. And, um, I just started telling them in my mind, I had, I actually had been visualizing doing a seat like this for somebody for a really, really long mm. time. Um, the, have you heard of the movie, The League of the Extraordinary Gentlemen? Yes. yes. Okay. So you- Well, I never watched it, but I- You did? Okay. <laughs> Dang it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well- I sounded too excited. Okay. So there's a designer who did um, a lot of the set design and stuff like that, like for the cars. Um, the ship for uh, the, the guy that goes 23,000 leagues under the sea, what's his name, whatever. He goes under the water and he has a submarine, right? And it looks like a knife just barreling through the ocean, mm -hmm. but on the front of his submarine, he's got this beautiful design on the front of it. I know it's just starting, you're kind yeah, of like, yeah, it's yeah, starting yeah. to come back, right? Yeah. Well, in my mind, when I saw that movie, I was so captivated, captivated by the design of the elements in the movie. I wanted to turn that somehow into a seat. So I came home that day and I started drawing out a bobber seat. Wow. Right? So years later, I have this guy that comes to me with uh, the dimensions of a bob receipt that are very close to what I had drawn mm. years ago, right? So he's asking me, well, what would you do with this seat? And so I start telling him what I wanted to do from years back from that. And his eyes are just like, <laughs> like lighting up, yeah. right? And so I gave him a price if I was just gonna redo his seat a little bit, you know, a little bit of leather and some braiding, whatever. And then he doubles it on me. He's right there on the spot. He goes, well, if you had this much, would you be able to do something with it? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, would it be enough for you to do the things that you want to do? And I'm like, I think I could work with it. <laughs> what else you got? Yeah. What else you want? Yeah. So uh, this is what I came up with. I mean, um, it's just, it's, you know, it's got this, uh, it's more like an imitation because we're not allowed to use uh, alligator anymore. Really? It's illegal? Or what? It's illegal in California. Wow. So we can't even get it. I know there's people who still have it because mm -hmm. they have, they bought it from before the law. Right. But yeah, we're not even, there's, there's nobody who carries it anymore. Is that a in big, California. Uh, get big trouble for that? I guess so. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, I've had other exotic leathers smuggled, if you will, right. you know, from other countries. Um, because we're in one country, like say kangaroo lace, I use a lot of kangaroo lace, mm. I still get that, but apparently that's supposed to have fallen under some California wow. stupid law. So kangaroos in Australia are considered rats there for them, they're vermin. Mm. But for us, it's, you know, a cuddly right. thing that jumps around and, and does stuff. Yeah. And for me, that doesn't affect me. But long and short, like this is all kangaroo lace. Um, this is like that imitation alligator. No, I, the, the, the lace, is that literally laced? 
Yeah, that's all hand braided. By hand, yeah, braided. so this right here is this is actually called the Mexican round braid applique. So this is not something that I do. Okay. This is something my wife does because we're a total team. Oh, your wife helps you out. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely, sweet, man. man. That's it's awesome. a funny. You guys are a, you're a real team. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, man. Like awesome. it. I, like I, I'll tell her what I want, right. where I want it, and then she'll do it. Yeah, but the funny thing is, when I first got her to do this, like you know, my first real big seat project actually came from trip. So I'm gonna out something <laughs> on this show that I've never told out loud before, but it's gonna happen here right now. There's a first for everything on <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so, um, so trip from Vato CV class, right? He got me connected to this one seat. And as a matter of fact, we have a picture of it right there for the Cinco de Mayo. Okay. That was the, that was one of my first big projects. Okay. So my first seat was this one up here. It says Redbeard original. Okay. I did it for my bike at the time, which was a wide glide, right? My second seat came along from Trip because he had seen all my work and stuff, and he really want, he thought it would really work well in the lowrider market, which it does. It, it just right. really does. So he gets me connected to this guy out in Texas. And so we're just making the switch over to doing leather work almost full time, right? And this guy's like, he's talking to me about stuff and what would you do here and what would you do there? And of course, I'm in the frame of mind, fake it till you make it. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? Like yeah. totally, and I was like, oh yeah, man, what I do, when I do custom seats, we do this and we do that, and you know, like, oh yeah, I'm previous or whatever. And my wife is over there looking at me on the phone while I'm having this conversation trying to sell this project because, yeah. you know, rents do. And uh, <laughs> she's like, look, just shaking her head like, what are you saying right now? <laughs> so I get off the phone I'm like, babe, I just sold our first seats, 1500 bucks, right? But there, I didn't even know how much time was going to be invested. Yeah. I'm guessing. And in your mind, things take 15 seconds. Right, right. Right? So... She goes, well, who's gonna do all this braiding you were talking about? I was like, you are. Yeah, I just she's, hired you. She's like, I don't know how to braid. I was like, you're gonna learn. <laughs> you're gonna learn, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so so we we start getting up on YouTube, right? She does really, yeah. and we're like calling everybody that we know. Who, it, nobody's teaching us anything. Like no one wants to share anything personally. So we're just like, man, YouTube. So my wife, I remember, I'll never forget. I walk into our bedroom. We have a flat screen TV and set up in front of our bed. And she's sitting there and she's got the leather in her hands. We just poked all the holes. I've done all the artwork. So I've done all the hard work. The, the lacing part is the last mm -hmm. thing to be done, right? She's never done it in her life before. And I walk in and she's pregnant on top of that. <laughs> she's pregnant with my second wow. child. So I walk in and she's sitting there with the leather in her hands, the lace dangling down, and she's crying profusely. She looks up at me. I just don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Why are you making wow, me do you. this? And I'm like, wow. I'm like, babe, you're gonna do great. You're gonna get it done because we have to. <laughs> Quit crying or pity cry. Stop it. I was like, you can cry all you want when that guy pays for this seat. <laughs> so this is done by hand all by hand, man. So for every inch that you see of actual braiding, mm -hmm. there's 11 inches of material in it. Wow. So it's in, she has to go through here. So we have to, that's the other thing too, is all the panels have to line up perfectly mm -hmm. and all the holes have to be punched directly across from each other. Okay. So there's even a specific way, like when I punch holes, we'll punch holes in a certain panel. Then I've got to physically line up all the holes and the holes are only an eighth of an inch apart. Okay, oh wow. For the lace. So we have to line up all the holes and then she goes through and she does her first round of braiding and then she has to keep going back around until it's all braided. Is there a secret? Not that you would give it. Is there a secret or is this you just is this laced? Is there a secret? Yeah, I mean there is some secrets. I mean it's not anything that I don't think I couldn't share, but when we first started doing seats, one of the things that we would notice is when she would start braiding the seats that the patterns, once it was all braided, would be shifted and it would be like, why are these shifting? So one day this guy sends us a seat to do and he wants it redone. As a matter of fact, it was uh, Anthony's seat. Okay. He sends me his seat and he wants it redone. Anthony, what's up? Little shout out. <laughs> so he's like, uh, I'll, you know, this is what I want. So he sends me the seat, I rip it all apart. Well, when we ripped it all apart, the answers were all there, right? Mm -hmm. So we look at this dude's braiding. I mean, the artwork was like, 
Well, there's a reason why I got it. So, uh, so <laughs> right, it was going that. So uh, we turn the seat over after we rip it all apart and we're looking at how he braided it from the backside. Cause really when you look at braiding from the front side, that tells you a story, mm. but from the backside, it tells the craftsman a different story. Wow, right? I never do that, okay. So we looked at the backside and we're like, oh my God, this is how he's doing his braiding. And we saw the little secret of why his artwork didn't shift. Mm. Cause when we looked at the two panels that were put together, that were laced, the pieces ended right where they were supposed to and were even on both sides. And for us, we'd always end up with an extra like half an inch or three quarters of an inch yeah. sticking out on the other side. And we'd have to stretch and kind of fake it all in. Even though the panels lined up. Still yeah, even though the panels lined up, but what happened is that when you're stretching, because think of it, you're, you're stretching like a, think of like a candy cane, right? When you're lacing, you're lacing like that kind of angle. Okay. But when you're pulling always in one direction at an angle, you're starting to shift the pattern the other direction, that makes sense. Yeah. right? Yeah. So as you do that all the way around, that translates all the way around. So as you shift an eighth, an eighth, an eighth, an eighth, an eighth, mm. right? Then another eighth, and it starts shifting the leather and stretching it right. out on one side. So what this guy did was he would lay glue leather pieces across the two panels and re-poke his holes mm. and then do all his braiding and that would hold the panels from shifting. Okay. And that was like, by the way, if you didn't pick that up. <laughs> so that's a trick of the trade, not a secret, really. It's a trick. So yeah, you, it's a trick. You guys out there just learning how to, uh, uh, I already forgot the word. The leather craft, if you learn how to do this type of leather craft, that right there, you should rewind and go back to the part where I just said what I just was doing. Yeah, I love this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you, you know, I'm sorry, this piece right here. Yeah. Did you guys see that? Um, this was a special piece, right? Yeah, so. It took, you, it took you a little bit to have this done? Yeah, so I drew up, the, so this is, the, this is the complication of me being me. Right, and, and it's, it, it, this may seem like just a piece, but when he tells the story, you'll, you'll know why it's not just a piece. It's not, so the, the complication of doing things that people have not done before is the fact that there's nobody to rely on to figure out how you're gonna do it, mm. right? Right. The, I would say the gift that God gave me for this is the fact that I can visualize these things to completion and I can somehow look at it in my mind to start figuring out a process if there is no process to rely on. Do you understand what yeah, I'm that's saying? that's huge, that's huge. Yeah. Okay, so I saw this in my mind a certain way, but I didn't know how necessarily how to get there. But if I could visualize the piece in my head, I could start looking at it. Mm. Right? Yeah. I could start and then go, okay, well, if this shape is here and this shape is here, and I know that that shape would go on this part of the seat, then this is how you would have to fabricate this sort of, right? Right. right. Some of it's guessing, okay? So that was one of the things that was holding us up on this project was because in my mind, I'm like, it makes me nervous. Like, how do you tackle this? And all of a sudden, because sometimes these procedures become so overwhelming, it's hard for you to want to move forward. Was this, was, I'm sorry, was this piece your idea? Like, yeah. Oh, okay. So the that, whole thing. So originally, was this going to be? Originally, this seat was, was the, originally this seat was only going to be like maybe this thick, like maybe an inch thick or inch and a half thick. Oh, wow. All the way through here. And it was just going to be cross laced like stitch like okay. baseball stitch all the way around and then i like said i want to do braiding i want to do different levels of layer uh, le le levels of leather and then you know with this whole nose plate uh the trip though how much that looks cool yeah that looks badass that looks badass and then if you were to see it with the bike all these shapes are in the paint and in the fabrication so just all, all of this is all supposed to flow yeah so this is another reason why i feel like when i look at a project some people get it some people don't like if you're just a guy who's trying to make a buck then you're going to get that kind of work mm. but for me i look at the overall big picture right. what is the flow of the image in front of me right the sexiest lines on a bike especially a road king is if you were to take the seat off of the bike and you look at the profile of the bike and you see the handlebars come down into that tank mm. and you take the seat off 
right? And then the tank into the frame. Right. And then off of that fender, and if it's like a tail dragger style fender or whatever, that to me is a sexy profile, mm. right? So then when you put the seat on, in my mind, the seat, should, the seat should accentuate those lines, not be something that stops you or hinders you from the flow of yeah. the bike. Cause me, to me, that's the real flow, is all that metal shape and fabrication is the real flow. It's sexy. When you really think about it, the reason why men are so attracted to this, the profile of a motorcycle is because in general, those profiles look very much like a woman laying down on her side. I don't know mm. if anybody's actually ever picked up on that. But no, if I never have. I want to go home and look at my bike and be like, dang, some girl. Oh yeah, baby. Yeah. And that's when you be like, oh, I know why you in the bag because you like girls with all that junk. Oh, bigger bags. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding, baby. Yeah. Let me get that profile, girl. So, uh, yeah, so. I never look at like that because I'm, I'm, I'm the type of guy, like, I don't work on my bike. I'll do very simple stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll get my, take my tires, get changed. Um, I don't, I don't care if, I'm not that guy who sits there and goes, yeah, I put air ride, I put handlebars. Yeah. I don't care. I'm going to take it down to AJ's uh, motorcycle deal or motorcycle repair shop. But AJ, I want this, this, that. And guess what? AJ killed it. And now I'm riding my motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so the guys that do do the work, I give them, man, I give them props because for me, I'm not that guy. I just want to ride. I want to have a good time. And uh, I have a couple of buddies who did all their work to their bike. And not me, I'm, I'm, I'm not that guy. So yeah. when, when you talk about lines and all that, you describing it, I see it. But I go home and look at my bike and I'll be like, right. Cool, we're okay, let's go running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see that. That's me, though. You know I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the motorcycle for you is probably, it's two things. One is the end result to your enjoyment, mm -hmm. right? Like it's a tool to access to that, right. that type of enjoyment. And two, also, it's something that sends a message to other people about who you are. This is a facet of who you are, right? Of your, of your identity and your character. So that's what motorcycles are. For me, I feel like when someone asks me to do something for them, this is an opportunity for me to serve them in what I feel like has been given to me to do for them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like definitely. this is going, this is me being able to show you appreciation because you took your hard earned money. You could have spent it in any way you wanted, but you decided to do something a little bit extravagant and work with my family so that I could passionately provide you with a service. Right. Right. So then it's not about the money anymore. Now it's about me saying, I want to show you how much I am grateful to you. So I'm going to give you the work that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. And it's not even a little bit. I always try to exceed or go beyond expectations, right? right? So that's why when it gets to a certain point, like on this seat, just fabricating that nose plate was ridiculous, right? It was just insane. I thank God, like originally I had a guy who wanted to do some, that I was going to work with to do some sew work, but his turnaround time was like nine months, eight months. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's not going to fit my timeline. Well, piece? On top of cost. So then I'm like, okay, well, this that's not how we can't, one, we can't do it that way. And Two, when I looked at what, in my mind, how it needed to be, because it's not just about the shape, it's also the weight, the thickness of the metal has to be a certain thickness for it to feel like there's something there. Right. The thinness of the silver that was gonna be on there was gonna be like paper thin. And I'm like, well, that's nothing. I mean, like, that doesn't feel like there's something heavy here and it needs to feel heavy in the front. So I got some um, cold steel, I got some 14 gauge steel, and thankfully I called up a friend of mine, um, the Flying Dutchman. He is a wizard master fabricator. Like he is probably one of the most amazing fabricators I know and probably one of the most amazing fabricators on this planet. Wow. And um, I told him what I was doing and I was very much expecting him to say something very similar, but crossing my fingers, it's maybe I'd have a leg up to get in there and just, right. just show me something that I can do because I've done metal fabrication in my past. Show me what you would do technically. Give me at least that much time. So he says, bring it over. Let me see what you got. So I bring it over. We start talking. And next thing you know, we just, he's like, come over tomorrow. Let's fabricate this thing up. So we cut out certain shapes and uh, he starts doing his work to it, man. He just starts doing some radical magic. And uh, trick. yeah, the original design was way bigger over this thing. Okay. But then when I saw the actual pieces as I had to form them and shape them to fit for him to, to TIG weld, cause I don't know how to TIG right. weld. Um, 
I actually made it even smaller because it needed it needs to be something that's there, but it does. I don't want it to be this overpowering piece in the front. I just want it to be that little extra on top. That mm. wow, and just in the fabrication alone, there has there was probably twenty five hours. Wow. Yeah. You guys, I hope we'll get a closer look of this, you guys, but. This thing is, uh, it, it may not seem like much, but it's, it's pretty uh, pretty it's, impressive. It's mostly because of the, sh the, all, there's four pieces on there. One, two, yeah, there's four pieces on there, but each one of them is curved completely different mm -hmm. against himself. Right. And that's what makes the fabrication and putting all those pieces together so unique and so difficult. And the reason why it looks so clean is because Jake, the Flying Dutchman, was able to see that the way I saw it and manipulate the metal to bring my vision to completion. Right, right. And that was big for me, like to be able to see this chromed out and dipped and like even the guy who does chrome, I called chrome shops everywhere. First off, there's not even a legit chrome shop in San no, Diego. Okay, okay. Yeah, California, they're just trying to, they're trying to remove all chrome shops. California wants all chrome shops gone. California. <laughs> like if I were to sit here and tell, oh yeah, yeah. if I were to sit here and tell you what they're trying to do to people who do powder coating, that's next, powder coating's next. So if I were to try to tell you what they're trying to do to people who do any type of electro coating, chemical coatings, it would blow you away. Like it makes me sad. Mm. It makes me totally sad. But that being said, um, I went and I found this one guy, Jake actually happened to refer him to me. I call him up, not only was his price half of what everyone else wanted to charge, but the guy was willing to, instead of dip it in like six months or three months, he said he would dip it. If I had it to him by Monday, right? Cause my deadline was like middle of the month at that time. He's like, if I had it, have it to him Monday, he'll have it dipped by Wednesday. Wow. And I can pick it up on Thursday. Oh. And I was like, what? So yeah, and the guy was so hardworking, went the extra mile, extra level. Oh, this is the other cool thing. So this is for, this is, so the seat looks really cool in the front. The owner, his nickname is Rabbit, right? Rabbit, okay. And he owns this woodworking company, right? So he, like, he'll look at a piece of wood and he just goes, berserk over grain, <laughs> like wood grain. So what I did just for him. Oh, dude, that's bad. So it says rabbit, Yeah. but in the R I made it really super big. And then I did wood grain inside yeah. the R. So that's just for him. No one else is really gonna see that. I don't know if you can see that in the thing or not, but um, that's just for him to see. No, and that seat is freaking, I know we got stuck on the seat, but it doesn't matter. This is, uh, well, you guys can hear this. this thing is solid, man. It's very heavy. It's very heavy. The plate in there is like, uh, just shy of a quarter inch. Whoever made the, the pan itself for this thing, they they, they made something that was supposed to last through the apocalypse. Hey, so uh, as far as like the, the leather, the, the leather work, how long have you been doing it as a full-time job where I guess, this is all you do, right? You don't do no. We don't do any. Uh, I don't. I don't do anything else. I haven't done construction in a long time, unless I want to. Um, but I think that's kind of cool because, like you said, unless you want to, it's still something you can have in your pocket. Oh, I still do it. You know, like I still build stuff all the time. You know, like it, it, it's never going to leave me right. because I really enjoy working with my hands. Um, but yeah, uh, it's probably been seven full years. Wow. So yeah, I, yeah, I think because when we met in 2014, I think you were about a year in. Yeah. I was like, man, this guy works on leather full time. Full time. I didn't know that was a thing. It wasn't at the time, and now um, I can say, but I didn't think of this before until someone else came to me and told me the, um, that the whole reason why they even got into leather, because the first thing they had bought from me was a custom wallet, mm. but they loved it so much that they wanted to try doing leather, and then they found the love for it. So some of my clients wind up becoming my competitors, but I don't, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't mind actually. I mean, honestly, because how many tattoo artists are out there? Right, right. You know what I mean? Like at some point you're gonna, I hope that I get to elevate somebody and inspire somebody to do something that they're passionate about. If that's what they're passionate about, great. If, you know, learning leather is something that gets you closer to your passion and learning that and unlocking that, then yeah, let's go for it, you know? And not, not only guys does, uh, is, is AJ, uh, in this craft, but he also rides. So he's not just making them for the bikes or for your bikes. He's also living the life on two wheels, man. To me, that's that's huge because um, some of these guys who who never rode or don't have bikes are making 
they make parts, parts, but they're not in it. Yeah, to me, I'm not knocking them, but I feel it's more legit when you got someone like yourself doing this, and I think your eye might be sharper too, like you said, the lines and all that stuff. I don't well, know, to me, it, you know, for me, and I get you 100%, like when someone is into cars, right, and they're making parts for cars, you know that they're thinking about the love of it also being for them. Right. Right? Right. So it's not just about the end user, it's also about the fact that they could imagine this for themselves. Right. Right? But people who don't or are not involved in the industry that they're partaking in, it's almost like living a little bit of a falsehood. You know right. what I mean? To me, it's like somebody who's just trying to cash grab a little bit. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it's great for innovation. Some people just, they they're able to do those things. But in my mind, man, when I think that's what gives somebody a leg up is when they're able to ride and they understand that this may not work for actual use. It looks good when your bike is sitting there, right. but it doesn't function, mm, you know? Function, so yeah. that's that's a big part of, of what we do too is functionality, you know, is, the, is in some cases it leads the design. Right. You know what I mean? I want things to function. That's why I tell all my clients this. I said, do not look at this as a seat with art on it. You have to look at this as a piece of art that functions like mm. a seat. You have to look at this as a piece of art that functions like a biker wallet. Whoa. If you don't see it that way, the reality is you're not my client. Mm. If you see this as a seat with just some art on it, then you need to go to the guy who does seats with art on them. So you're not selling trophy pieces? No. In a sense, um, you, you're, but you're selling you just said the art that is being used. Yeah, it's functional. functional. It's functional art. Uh, and you know, we do have clients that they'll get a seat like this guy, right? You know, he's long sold his bike, yeah, but he's kept the seat mm. because this means something to right. him. Um, and there's a lot of clients that we have that way. Even when they're doing show bikes, you know, a lot of them, they're building the bike because it's a message of some kind. And I think the ones that really affect me are the memorial bikes. The bikes mm. that have a memorial where it's their son right. or a lost loved one. Those are the ones that are really like big messages. And I, I love working on those because it, it's, it's such a deeper meaning for them. It's not just about their identity, their character, coming up with the, a, a cool theme that no one's done before, or attacking a theme that someone's done before, but they're gonna try and one-up it. Right. This is something that's so personal that anything that you do, it speaks to who they are, but also maybe who the loved one was as well. Mm. And it's deeper than, than just Way the deep, man. I, you know, those pieces that I get to do, like I've had a, a handful of, of those types of clients and when they come into the shop and they see the finished product, like we'll have like an all out cry together. Mm. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not afraid right, to, right, right. I ain't gonna lie about that. I, I am a man who will cry with other men. <laughs> yes. So yeah, it's just, I, I love this community, man. I love the motorcycle community. And I mean, you'll, you'll see this in, in most, and I think in most of the power sports communities in some way, but the motorcycle community, let me put it to you this way. I remember when I was a kid, and if someone was broke down on the side of the road, how many people would pull over? Mm, none. Right? And even now, when someone's broke down, like I remember all the time, my dad would always pull over. So we would always pull over for guys. And now, with the smartphones, why would you pull over? They can call somebody, they got somebody, they got help. Right. This is prior to cell phones, right? In the motorcycle community though, that hasn't changed. Yeah, you're right. Right? You see somebody broke down, you're likely to thumbs up, thumbs down when you're rolling by or pull over and say, hey man, do you need some help? Is there somebody I can call to help you out? Are you good? You know, like, cause you don't know, right? right? Because when you're in a cage, you have protection. You have airbags, you have sensors, you have cameras. When you're on a bike, you have none of that. You've got your helmet and your gear and that's it. And even after that, if, if you're coming up and you see a group, you'll still stop. Like, yeah. Everything good. Oh, yeah, it's kind of flat, bro. All right, cool. Later. So there's it's something different there, man. There's a there's a there's a unique quality that binds us all together. That when we're riding, there's like when you're in a in a foxhole in war, hmm. right? You may not know the guy next to you well, but when you're in that foxhole and you're sharing that experience that's your best friend, mm, Yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And I can say that about the motorcycle community. I may not know you well, but you're in my foxhole. Right. So at the very least, I wanna make sure you're taken care of to some degree. 
Mm. And that's the only, this is the only community I've ever experienced that in. So we'll see you in the foxhole coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.